I'd like to thank the Alexander Hamilton Institute for the opportunity to speak here today. <clears throat> the Institute follows the and the intellectual path of its namesake. The need for a serious understanding of Hamilton's ideas has never been more important to the American polity's future than it is today. Uh, this presentation today comm commemorates Veterans Day. The Institute inaugurated it in 2013 to honor Lieutenant General Josiah Bunting III. General Bunting is a charter member of the Alexander Hamilton Institute's Board of Directors and is a man of uh, exceptional accomplishment. A uh, graduate of the Virginia Military Institute, he received a Rhodes Scholarship and studied at Oxford. During military uh, active duty with the U.S. Army, he served in Vietnam with distinction. His medals include the Bronze Star, uh, Army Commendation Medal, and the Vietnam Honor Medal. He taught history at West Point and at the Naval War College. He was president of Briarcliff College from 1973 to 1977 president of Hampton Sydney College from 77 to 87, and then superintendent of the Virginia Military Institute from 95 to 2003. <clears throat> General Bunting has published four novels and a biography of um, Ulysses Grant that helps shatter the myths his political enemies spun and sets the record straight on the virtue of Grant's presidency. <clears throat> which is considerable. But some myths benefit. Virgil's Aeneid is unique in the Western canon. A, uh, a self-intentional propaganda piece marketed as myth. The text is a post-Republican refounding of Roman civic glory. Virgil's composition of the text spanned nearly all of Augustus's rule. Virgil's friend and fellow poet, Propertius, claimed that Augustus himself commissioned the work. Although we'll never know if that assertion is true, the text itself becomes so thoroughly entwined with Roman history and culture as to make it synonymous with Rome and with Augustus. Trite comparisons place the American Republic alongside Rome's. Like any good analogy in popular political analysis, there is, however, some truth to it. Both were begun as republics in the legitimate sense of the word. And I mean here the term imported into the English language from the Latin race publica the term that titled Cicero's foremost work on political theory, <clears throat> a work intentionally written in dialogue with Plato's Politeia. A republic is a mixed polity, deriving its strength from the combination of monarchical, aristocratic, and democratic elements. Both republics evolved, however, in a way that unbalanced the mixture of regimes within them. In Rome's case, the Republic's foundations were eroded by its expansion and subsequent wealth. Roman conquest brought vast tracts of territory under the Republic's control and ultimately gave individual generals, some nominally aristocrats, some not, but all from a similar class, the ability to command the loyalty of individual soldiers. Strategy became a function of personal and class interest. Exactly what the Republic, stru Republic structure seeks to avoid by providing to all classes the right and responsibility to rule. Absent external enemies that could serve as an outlet for individual ambition, the Roman Republic turned on itself in a century-long process of mutilation and bloodletting. Augustus ended the process uh, reimposing order 
and structure on a volatile system. It's, it's within this context that the Aeneid was composed. Refashioning the tale of a minor pious Trojan into the founding epic of the Roman Republic, which was being refounded as a bureaucratic imperial entity. Virgil's genius was his ability to recapture the martial, pious, simple virtues that defined Roman Republican greatness, even as the polity loosed its Republican moorings. We don't know the future of the American Republic. Rome's transition and common sense imply that excessive partisanship and class divisions threaten its foundations. But there are other, uh, neither patricians nor plebeians today, no matter what appearances are supposed to blue-blooded elites or their vox populi counterparts put on. Some elements of ochlocratic volatility are apparent. The pseudo-political street violence that has intensified since the mid 2010s, I think would be recognizable to a Roman senator or even a, a politically engaged Athenian. But the country is not particularly democratically responsive. Rather, the American polity is out of balance because of a hybrid, a new force. Uh, let's call it bureaucracy. I call it bureaucracy. Um, the uniquely European term, the power that springs from a desk, signals the triumph of Weber, of Weberian and Hegelian administration over a more traditional understanding of government. One that held at its core prudence and statecraft rather than scientific expertise. The bureaucratization of the American polity may explain our deep disinterest in actual democracy. All republics trend toward one regime or another by design. The French Republic is leans toward the monarchical, its president vested with tremendous power. The English Republic is aristocratic, despite the House of Lords inability to guide legislation. The US is a thoroughly democratic republic by design. We hold elections virtually every year for some office or another. Every two years, we hold national legislative elections and state elections every four years, national, state, and executive elections. Nominally, Americans should vote more than citizens of any other polity. What's more, they should vote in contexts that influence ten, tens to hundreds of millions. The very fact that our federal system is criticized for its anti-democratic nature demonstrates our receding grasp of what democracy means. American affinities to Europe run far deeper than the standard narrative admits. Indeed, the modern interpretation of the revolution, that is what was once its modern interpretation prior to its modification by the 1619 Project's attempt to uh, intellectually refound American history, is that America was understood as a departure from Europe, a rejection of the old world, and an entirely distinct political entity. This is untrue. The founders were all steeped in the European, specifically the English political tradition. The revolution occurred because they felt they were denied the rights due to them as Englishmen. And despite the course of events that compelled their new nation separation from England, they still viewed the English regime as the best of worldly regimes and the English as the most free, uh, happiest men in Europe. Alexander Hamilton was the most noted and, and curious of Europhiles among the founders. Unlike the Jeffersonian agrarians who cherished the, the bucolic character of a land owning democracy ruled by quasi English gentlemen, Hamilton saw commerce and industry as keys to national life. 
his European uh, inclinations were more jarring. Hamilton leaned perceptibly toward mon monarchism. He believed that the president should be an, a, a kind of elected sovereign, ruling for life and less impeached for poor behavior. Although Hamilton's monarchical proposal was never adopted, he authored all Federalist essays uh, specifically discussing the presidency. The American executive therefore intentionally resembles, I say resembles a monarch with expansive powers in foreign and defense contexts. The American link to Europe is most relevant, not in uh, political, theoretical, cultural, or even, even religious terms. It, it is a strategic link. America's fate has always been tied to Eurasia. Hence the greatest of American statesmen always gravitate toward Eurasia. Why is it so difficult for Americans to grasp their link to Eurasia? Because America is not wholly European and therefore is not physically rooted in Eurasia strategic rhythms. This is a great distinction between the United States and its Eurasian cousin, Russia. For it is not England, but Russia that the United States most resembles. Both are polyglot empires that span continents. Both rule uncountable subjects. Both have access to immense resource wealth. Both have deeply varied geography as one extends across their territories. Both expanded in waves, slowly conquering a remarkably similar steppe land from various poorly organized statelets and tribal entities. Russia, for a host of reasons, never, never imbibed democracy. Subject for a different time. The American founding ended with the apotheosis of George Washington. The closest moment Russia has to a founding is not, despite the Putin regime's propaganda, the establishment of Kievan Rus with its partly mythical just kings. It is rather uh, even the terrible. The first czar of all Russians, the founder of the first Russian secret police, and in a deeply ironic twist, the inaugurator of the time of troubles, modern Russia's first imperial disintegration. Much as Qin Shi Huang founded China, but the Han Emperor Gaozu sticks in historical memory, so will Ivan the Terrible forever stand behind Michael I Romanov. America is an island continent. It faces and has never faced a geopolitical threat from the Western Hemisphere. It is the dominant New World power, a legitimate hyperpower, and has been so since the early 20th century. America is also not a single nation, but like Imperial Russia, a collection of nations, of states, stitched together into a federal republic. Some of these states have maritime interests, giving their citizens and statesmen a more reflexive understanding of the role Eurasia plays in American life. Many of them lack this understanding. A Jeffersonian Virginian would never grasp the role of commerce and maritime trade that was important in American prosperity, like in the same way that Hamilton, Hamiltonian New Yorker or New Englander. These crucial cultural cleavages, cleavages have shifted over time. Now our divide is between a coastal urban left and a suburban rural non-coastal right. But we can still see the reverberations of the previous political divides in American life today. The American Republic's fate has always been tied to Eurasia. The Eurasian landmass contains and is almost guaranteed to contain well into the future the vast majority of humans and resources globally. Economic productivity 
it's a different matter. But strategy begins with material factors. And materially, Eurasia is the arena on which the geopolitical game must be played. Any power or coalition of powers that can control the Eurasian landmass can, at minimum, significantly damage the non-Eurasian powers and at most conquer them. Water has little stopping power. Contrary to our supposed sagacious prognosticators of international events, it is the political difficulty of maintaining a Eurasian coalition, not the physical impediment of global oceans per se, that disrupts Eurasian dominance. But even the threshold of outright conquest, the Eurasian hegemon can bend its adversaries to its will, uh, denying them access to markets, projecting power beyond Eurasia into their own strategic areas, and ultimately compelling a choice between moderately prosperous servitude and harsh autarkic independence. The Eurasian problem, either actively or passively, has always dominated the thoughts of American strategists. Ironically enough, the American Revolution arguably caused European Eurasia's severe upheaval in the late 18th century. France's support to the 13 colonies added another budgetary stress to the French treasury, which was a, obviously a contributing factor to the revolution, the 1789 revolution. America's fate has been tied to Eurasia, therefore, since before the republic's founding. This fact eludes us because apart from uh, a brief moment in the 1860s, the Eurasian, Eurasian balance was regulated. The UK, an insular Eurasian power rather than a continental one, placed limits on Eurasian competition. Even after it withdrew all political linkages from the European continent and retreated into splendid isolation, disaster, by the way, a disastrous choice, the effects of which would only become clear far later in the 19th century, the UK remained powerful enough to dominate the Eurasian littorals and thereby regulate Eurasian rule. Apart from the US's brief intervention into the Napoleonic Wars, the US and UK had, a, had few inherent strategic disagreements. London was willing to leave well enough alone in the Americas, while Washington was an enthusiastic supporter of British Eurasian naval hegemony. The Civil War is the only exception to this period of relative strategic tranquility. A more adventurous France, or uh, even an England that had not so thoroughly embraced the anti-slavery movement, may have provided the Confederacy with an <clears throat> open strategic support. The Union victory eliminated the final opportunity of an individual Eurasian great power to modify the course of events. The U.S., with its demographic and economic strengths, was practically destined to dominate the global economy. Nevertheless, Lincoln's veg vigorous prosecution of the war and his continued emphasis on a blockade of the Confederacy stemmed from his understanding of the international context. The U.S. asserted itself, thereby deterring a potentially disastrous intervention. The American role in Eurasia became far clearer by the early 20th century. The US was one of the two Eurasian powers alongside Imperial Japan that had disrupted the Eurasian balance. Their economic strength and growing military capabilities, in particular, their naval power, broke the traditional system. Previously, Control of the European littorals was synonymous with Eurasian and global sea control. After the 1890s, this was no longer the case. Any power that sought to regulate 
Eurasian politics was faced with a choice. Either expand military capacity mightily and ensure control over all of Eurasia's littorals and the American choke points between Eurasia's hives or <clears throat> at Mont Canal, or cut various deals and seek a, a strategic reset. The UK is often praised for its prudence before the Great War by concluding an explicit agreement with Japan and a tacit one with the United States. <clears throat> the UK, as the argument runs, could refocus its attention on Europe and contain a rise in Germany. In fact, the British policy apparatus gave little thought to such momentous strategic changes and ultimately failed to contain Germany without a grossly overpriced butcher's bill. Britain's lack of foresight continued well after the Great War. It never, never once sought to leverage its position as the crucial maritime power in the victorious coalition to regain Eurasian naval mastery. All other policy choices were subtle adjustments that did little to stave off the ultimate result. And that was, of course, imperial dissolution. The uh, nobility of Churchill's premiership stems primarily from its hopelessness. That is, its willingness to sacrifice the empire for the cause of liberty, rather than to cut a deal with Hitler and pursue imperial delusions for a decade more. The U.S. throughout this period flirted with Eurasian engagement. It briefly sought its full weight to bear, and it brought its full weight to bear in, uh, in 1917, 1918. A belated choice, I should add, for a, an earlier intervention would have shortened the Great War. Prevented, maybe, Imperial Russia's collapse and precluded much of the savagery that scarred Europe so deeply and ultimately spawn Nazism and Marxist-Leninism. It then withdrew, leaving Eurasia to its fate, re-engaging only some 20 years later when a new threat loomed. The US took up a role in Eurasian security decades after the initial opportunity for this role arose, and only through the patient efforts of the American Republic's careful statesmen. The historical and strategic linkages between the Eurasian balance and the American national interest must be aligned with our current strategic reality. The United States faces the greatest threat to its strategic position in its history. The increasingly coherent entente between Russia, China, Iran, and other fellow travelers is partially to blame. Six distinct factors make this challenge far more robust than the challenges Imperial Germany, Nazi Germany, um, and Imperial Japan and the Soviet Union and China posed. First, from a purely material perspective, the US faces a far greater quantitative threat today than ever. The Chinese economy might overtake the US's. Proportionally, however, it dwarfs the Soviet economy. The Russian Federation may be a gas station with the country, but that gas station can compete almost indefinitely with the West, even under exclusively uh, autarkic conditions. Iran is by, for, by far the poorest of the three powers, but again, it provides significant oil reserves to the Eurasian revisionist coalition. China's population is married to Russian and Iranian resources. Second, this new revisionist bloc has access to every Eurasian subregion. The Soviet Union struggled for decades to project power in the Middle East. China could never seriously assault Taiwan during cold, the Cold War for want of legitimate capabilities. 
Neither power posed an overwhelming near-term threat in the Indian Ocean and Western Pacific. Despite the strategic relevance of both regions, and particularly the latter region in US Eurasian defense strategies. No more. Today, China has significant power projection capabilities that allow it to penetrate the first island chain. Taiwan in Chinese hands would give the PRC the ability to dominate the Western Pacific, even without a resolution to the dilemma posed by the Malacca Straits or their blockage. Russia, despite its difficulties in Ukraine, remains a formidable nuclear armed threat. Without Western focus on the threat, Russia will simply win. A harsh long-term occupation will tie down Russian resources, but the European security order will be shattered, creating new room for Chinese disruption. Iran, Overwhelmingly through its linkages with Russia and China, has advanced its military technology enough to threaten Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Israel. It's not anymore a low threshold threat. Nuclear armed or not, it possesses a significant problem to American and allied interests. The revisionist coalition therefore presses the US at every point of the Eurasian perimeter. Third, the revisionist coalition has learned from the mistakes of its antecedents. China is particularly relevant. Xi Jinping is now chairman of everything and chairman for life. The most consequential Chinese ruler since Mao she came of age during the Cold War as a red princely, the son of the CCP's first generation elites. He witnessed the Soviet Union's collapse. His speeches and private remarks demonstrate his deep disdain for Mikhail Gorbachev, a disdain that only Vladimir, that only Vladimir Putin matches in intensity. Gorbachev, however, was emblematic of a broader illness within the Soviet elite. After Stalin's death, each generation of Soviet leadership, as distinct from the military men who were tasked with fighting a uh, Russia-NATO war, sought a, a, a chimerical detente with the US. Russia hoped the, I'm sorry, Khrushchev hoped the Cuban crisis would even the balance between Moscow and Washington, allowing him to negotiate on favorable terms and after settling strategic issues, turn inward and reform the USSR. Brezhnev explicitly pursued detente. Gorbachev's glasnost and perestroika were domestic, element, domestic elements of a detente policy. Gorbachev simply miscalculated on their long-term effect and lacked the stomach to undo his mistakes with violence. She, by contrast, has grasped an essential authoritarian truth. No despotism as large as China or the Soviet Union or even Russia can survive without reordering the world around it to suit its domestic system. There will be no detente with Xi's China or Putin's Russia. Both must dominate or perish. Fourth, the US is fiscally constrained. It could very well sustain far greater defense spending. As it stands, the American defense budget is approximately equivalent to what it was between 95 and 97 as a percentage of GDP. That is, the same proportion as when the greatest threat the US faced was a little known group named Al Qaeda, based primarily in Sudan. Rather, a variety of political constraints are throttling defense. An ever expanding social safety net, one that remains uh, astonishingly inefficient in its distribution of resources eats up annual spending. 
Our holiday from fiscal and monetary history, meanwhile, is near an end. A variety of pent up macroeconomic pressures have generated the inflation that we're seeing. The US government, meanwhile, embraces a variety of geoeconomically bizarre policies, uh, in particular, decarbonization and a quixotic drive toward net zero that if it is to be achieved in the time frame demanded, requires nothing less than total social economic transformation. And even if a spending injection were forthcoming, the US has consciously allowed its defense industrial base and broader industrial base to atrophy. It will take years, even with a major spending injection to ensure that the US can absorb funds to expand the military. We don't have those years. Um, as Commander Charles Richard, um, I'm sorry, Admiral uh, Charles Richard, who's the commander of the US Strategic Command, dared to say publicly last week, and this is a quote, the Ukraine crisis that we're now in is just the warm up. The big one is coming and it isn't going to be very long before we're going to get tested in ways that we haven't been tested in a long time. Fifth, the U.S.'s adversaries are far closer to moving on immediate tactical objectives than we expect. Russia moved on Ukraine, failed to conquer it immediately, and is now locked in an open-ended confrontation with the West that certainly resembles open war. Iran, now facing a politically stabilized assertive Israel, may very well sprint for a nuclear weapon and regardless is likely to give its Arab neighbors a punch in the nose. Most critically, the People's Liberation Army has the capabilities to take Taiwan. We need to be careful with our assessments. Being capable of executing a vastly complex military operation is radically distinct from the military balance tilting against the US. This fact alone should give us some pause. The cross-strait status quo, and by extension, the entire Asian security system, rest upon the premise of unmatched American conventional power, far more so than the European security system. It is imprudent to discuss whether China is deterred or not. The question that the Communist Chinese Communist Party and the People's Liberation Army face is one of timing for an assault. Thus, the threats that the current Eurasian security system have intensified just as the US approaches the nadir of its national policy, if we're lucky. Sixth, the US allies are unwilling or unable to share the burden, as it is now commonly described, or has been for years, for Eurasian security. But this does, does not mean that we can simply abandon them. The Europeans have not pulled their weight in Ukraine, nor have they responded in the post-February 24th strategic situation in a irrational manner. Despite their claims to higher defense budgets, they've done very little to expand their industrial bases, uh, align strategies and policies against Russia, and most important, recognize that any sort of burden sharing is desirable between them and the Americans. Still, abandoning Europe would destroy the broader Eurasian order. It would probably lead to de-dollarization a complete reorientation of the global financial and trade system towards Central Eurasia, and the elimination of the US's ability to regulate movement in the Eurasian littorals, the prerequisite for a coherent Eurasian strategy. Abandoning the Middle East would do the same. It would rip out the central node in the Eurasian trade network, irrespective of petrochemical flows. Eurasia must be fought for as a whole, cannot be defended in part. 
Virgil's Poesis Mythos, written in the tradition of Greek tragedy and by extension of Greek philosophy is circular. We begin and end in the human world, albeit after having traveled for some time from Ilium to Latium. Yet the text center, its high point is a journey in, into the underworld. Much as Plato Socrates takes the reader to Hades, exploring the underworld's depths and again escaping them, Virgil's hero descends, Aeneas descends into hell with a guide, the Sibyl, a Greek soothsayer. Mm -hmm. Near the text center, Aeneas is given a shocking vision, a vision of war and violence, of rivers bubbling in blood. Yet he's told that if his courage and piety fail him not, he will be brought to safe harbor. The likelihood of great power conflict rises by the day. We may have passed the point of deterrence some five or 10 years ago. The structural forces within the international system will be released. Our question is not whether we can prevent war. It is rather after the bill is paid and we have done the hard bloody work of winning it, whether we can capitalize on that victory and remake a Eurasian system that is consistent with our values. I'd like to end here and thank the Alexander Hamilton Institute again for the honor of speaking today, Veterans Day 2022. Thank you.